at some of my favorite movies, and we're talking a little bit about how movies, the movies that we watch, can be a really great bridge into having those spiritual conversations that we should be having with our friends and our neighbors and stuff like that. I don't know if you know this, if you've been reading your New Testament or not, but Jesus often, in fact most often, used stories to convey kingdom ideas to the people. They were plain stories, regular stories, stories that people could relate to in that day. And what better way for us to do that very same thing in our present day context than to use the movies that we see as bridges to bridge the gap into having conversations that will uh, tell people things about the kingdom of God and perhaps even connect people with Jesus Christ. I know it sounds a little bit far-fetched, but there is a method to my madness. All right, but seriously, <laughs> this movie is one of my all-time favorites because, well, Batman. Um, I've watched this movie so many times, and I still get excited when I watch it even today. Um, and, and regardless of how many times I have watched it or will watch it, what I find interesting about the movie is that every time I watch it, when I get to those parts in the movie, those, that line leaps out at me leaps out. It grabs a hold of me and I often miss the next few minutes of the film because I start spinning on this thing. I start thinking about those words. It's not who I am underneath but what I do that defines me. Now it may not be exactly what the writers meant when they put it into the story but every time I hear it I start thinking about that passage from James and what he said uh, in the passage you heard Derek read earlier from James chapter 2 verse 17 in fact where it says in the same way faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action then it's dead there is a lot to be said about the difference between thinking or understanding something and faith because they're not the same you see, faith isn't just believing that something is true. Faith isn't something that, that we just understand. Faith is something that's activated in our spirit. It is something that is done by the work of the Holy Spirit of God. If it helps, I've always put it this way. I've always said that faith isn't just something you believe. Faith is something that you do. And that's because faith is more than an idea. Faith is something that we live. So even if it's not what the writers meant when they wrote it and put it into this Batman Begins movie, every time I hear the words, it's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me, I think about what the scripture tells me about my life and faith and what I am to be looking like. I start thinking about my activity of faith, what I do in this journey. And I'm reminded of all kinds of passages in the Bible that speak to this. Not just the second chapter of James, because there's lots. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever given it like deep consideration? Because I, I, I don't know that, uh, that I used to. Something triggered in me a while back, and now every time this subject matter comes up, I find myself thinking about it for days sometimes on end. And I wonder... I wonder if we consider it enough, because I think sometimes we have a tendency to think about it the wrong way, or at least think about it with blinders on. You see, there are several passages in Scripture that talk about the activity of our faith in, in the context of feeding the hungry, you know, clothing the naked, caring for widows and orphans. I'm sure we've all heard passages like that or had conversations like that. And most often, the conversations that I have about this subject, about what we do with our faith, most of those conversations, the people will go right back to this. They'll start talking about clothing the naked and feeding the hungry and stuff like that. Those outward ministry works. But here's the thing. Those works, those outward ministry works, the things that we do outwardly for others, are actually a byproduct of our first work in the kingdom of God. See, there are far more passages in Scripture that talk about the work that is done in our hearts that we do in cooperation with the Holy Spirit than there are passages about service and outreach ministry. 
And I mean way more. Now please understand me, I'm not talking about trying to define the word work as it's used in Scripture, because honestly, if you go through the Scripture, you're going to find, what I'm about to tell you, that when the Scriptures use the word work, they are usually talking about feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, right? They're talking about serving, usually. But what I'm talking about today is considering all of what our activity of faith should look like. Because our journey in the kingdom of God our journey with Jesus is about a whole lot more than just serving and outreach. This scene in Batman Begins reminds me that my faith life is about a whole lot more than just what I think about God. My faith life should reflect God. So we're going to look at Colossians Chapter 3, verses 12 to 17 today. And we're going to kind of go through it bit by bit. This is one of many, many passages that gives us a glimpse into what it looks like when we're on this journey of faith, or at least what it should look like. So the first verse, beginning in verse 12, it says, As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. I find it interesting that Paul uses uh, the, the term clothe yourself in this passage. Right? Clothing. And, and I find it interesting because clothing isn't something that's a part of you, right? I mean, it's something that we put on to cover up. It's something that I might put on to protect myself or prepare myself or just, you know, sometimes look good, right? And clothing is something that we put on that we don't necessarily, sit, necessarily start out with. You know what parenting has done for me? It's helped me to recognize the importance of having the right clothing for the right season. You know what I mean? I mean, when I was a kid, I used to just put clothes on and go out and do stuff, right? I didn't even think about it. I just put stuff on and I went out and did stuff. That was my life. As a parent, I find myself constantly yelling stuff like, you're not going anywhere dressed like that. <laughs> it's almost 20 below outside. Put a coat on. And, and sometimes on occasion it's, Jamie, you have to wear pants. <laughs> yeah, welcome to my life. <laughs> what we clothe ourselves with isn't just about covering up, you understand. Sometimes it's about making a statement, showing the world what we believe ourselves to be. Crystal's very artistic and she dresses very artistically sometimes. She even does her hair to reflect that. Sometimes it's just straight up protective, like when you put on work boots or, or a safety vest. Sometimes we clothe ourselves in a way to prepare ourselves, like you would give yourself <coughs> careful consideration of what you're going to wear to a job interview because of what's coming down the pipe. The point is, what we clothe ourselves does not come from within. It's something that we put on. So it's kind of like Paul is saying, you know, the weather's pretty rough out there. You better put this on so that you're ready. You're going to face some stuff today. Put these things on so that you can weather the storm. <coughs> I mean, when you get up each day, you may not feel like being compassionate. You may not feel like being kind or humble or meek or patient. But you can put those things on. We can act this way even when we don't feel like it. <coughs> okay. These are things that we can do intentionally to demonstrate godliness to the people we encounter in our day. Clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, meekness, and patience. Let's keep going. Verse 13 says... Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also <coughs> must forgive. Okay, so after the last, over the last few months, we have talked a lot about forgiveness, haven't we? A lot. We bring it up so many, I don't know how many times I've preached on it now, I'd have to go back and look, but I know I talk about it almost every service. It is a big thing. And the reason for that is that 
Jesus talked a lot about forgiveness. I don't think you spend any time studying the New Testament, but i got to tell you, in the Gospels, Jesus brings it up a lot. Forgiveness is huge. In this particular context, Paul is writing to believers. So this reminder that we must forgive one another is clearly about just that. Forgiving one another. It's important for us to recognize how foundational forgiveness is to our faith. More than that, we should recognize that as it is with all things in the kingdom of God, it starts here. It starts among our brothers and sisters of faith in the church, in our family. Remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as the soldiers were preparing to come and get him, he was in the garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying for you. He's praying for you and me. And the prayer that Jesus, is, that Jesus prayed was that we would be one. Just like he and the Father are one. That you and me, you and each other, us as the church, that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. Something that is impossible in division. Yes? Still with me? Still like me? Okay, we're good. All right. So I think that this scripture is a really good reality check for us because Paul is not suggesting that this is something we can do. He's not even saying that this is something we should do. He's saying that just as the Lord has done this for you, so also you must do this with each other. Must. And this is where discipleship gets sticky. This is where the journey of faith gets difficult because i got to tell you, I've been in a situation many times in my life where forgiveness just wasn't on the horizon. I, I couldn't get there. I was so upset or I had been wounded so deeply. I, I tried. I wanted to. I felt like I, I should. But I hurt. See, that's the thing about relationship. If forgiveness is required, it's because there's been hurt. And hurt, well, hurts. That's the problem with forgiveness. There's so much emotion tied up into it. If you're anything like me, often when somebody hurts me, I want them hurt back. Right? You've seen that bumper sticker? Hurt people, hurt people? That's not a command, by the way. Hurt people, hurt people. It's hurt people have a tendency to hurt people. It's not on purpose. It isn't necessarily even malicious. It's just a statement of fact that often people who are hurt wound other people inadvertently. Out of our wounding, we cause harm. I mean, that's what 90% of the action movies out there are all about. Bad guys hurt people, Batman shows up and the bad guys get what's coming to them, right? We all go, yay! <laughs> that, now hear me, that is normal. That is natural. But in Christ, we are not normal. We are not natural. We are abnormal and supernatural. We are not to look like everybody else. That's what the journey of faith is all about. It's about a transformation. It's a, it's a change. It's not just about thinking differently. It is about reflecting Jesus out to the world, not just in, like, I've memorized all these scriptures and I can tell you a ton of stuff about the Bible. My life should look like his life. And if I'm being honest with you, it doesn't. It doesn't, not yet. I'm still, I'm still trying to walk in agreement with the Spirit. I'm still trying to face the things that I fear. I'm still trying to give over things that I, I'm pretending I still have control of, because that's just an illusion anyway. I mean, I'm still walking this just like the rest of you are walking this. And when I look at myself in the mirror, man, sometimes I can just see glaring back at me all the things that are not him. There's still work to be done. We are abnormal. We are supernatural. And in all things, we should be doing it like Christ. In everything, we should be acting like Jesus, not like everybody else. 
So practically speaking, there may be times in your life when it is difficult, when you may have to ask God to help you to forgive people because you just can't seem to get there on your own. And it's not always going to be easy because it's not always going to be small. Right? My kid drops a plate in the kitchen, it's over before it's even done with. It's an accident. It's not a big deal. Forgiveness is easy when it's something small. It's the big things we're challenged by. Not because there's any real difference in one wrong against another in that sense, but rather because the emotional weight of certain things are so heavy for us that we are challenged in our flesh. But it's like what Paul wrote in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I remember years ago, a friend of Tracy's came to visit us at our home. It's a friend from work, and she, she loved Jesus, and she was a funny lady. Oh, my goodness. She just, I just laughed for hours whenever she came over. She was just she was bubbly, bombastic is the word I think of. Like She's just silly all the time, goofy. She was a lot of fun. And uh, so full of energy, she made me look comatose. You know what I'm saying? All right. So she would come over to her house, and she would go on and on and on about all this stuff. Tell us all these stories. Praise Jesus. Pray over us, and she would leave. This one time she comes over, and she began talking about this fellow. And I got to say that as she told the story, she talked about this guy, the way he treated her. Well, let's just say that I came away with a distinct feeling that she legitimately had cause to be really, really angry with this guy. But she loves Jesus deeply. And she was kind of at war within herself. And she was having a lot of trouble with this thing because she knew up here. She even knew in here that she needed to forgive this guy. But she just couldn't stand him. You know what I'm saying? Like, she just, like, would rather just go with the nose, right? She was so put up. He hurt her. He hurt her badly. And she was really struggling. So she was telling us about a prayer that she had been praying, a prayer that I'm going to share with you. Uh, in my own words, because I can't quite remember exactly what she said. It's an easy prayer. It's simple. I don't think you're going to need to write it down. I think you'll be able to remember it. What she prayed was something like this. She said, Father, I know that you want me to forgive this guy, but I can't stand him. <laughs> I need you to help me. Now, we laugh because it is a little funny, but the truth is that's a very good prayer. Father, I know you want me to forgive, but I hurt so much, I don't know what to do with that person. I don't know what to do. And if you want me to forgive them, you, you're going to have to do something in me. Change whatever needs to be changed in me so that I can do your will. Now understand you may not like hearing this. I don't know. I'm just going to say it. If you're offended, that's okay. I got my big boy pants on. I can take it. <laughs> Understand that when we need to forgive someone, but we can't, what needs to change is something in us, not something in them. Let me say that again. When we need to forgive in a relationship, and we have forgiveness that should be going out, but we can't get there because it's too big, what needs to change in that situation is something in us, not something in the other person. Because if we're being really honest, forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. Yes, they benefit from it, but forgiveness is not about the other person. Forgiveness is about our journey of faith. Forgiveness is about our Christ-likeness. If we were going to put one word as a label over Jesus to describe who he is, that word would be forgiveness, would it not? To encapsulate his character? No, I may be going out on a way of a limb. There's a lot of words we could use to describe him in his sovereignty, in his wholeness, in his oneness with the Father, in his greatness, our salvation. He is our gift of life. But he is forgiveness, isn't he? And if we are going to forgive, that is what we need to model. Let's keep going. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. 
So he's using the word clothed again. Put it on. This may not be what you have on the inside, but it is something that you can wear. And I like this. I like that he's put it this way because once again, we're back talking about love. Talk about something I've preached on a lot since I've been here too, right? I bring up love all the time. Why? Because Jesus talked about it a lot. Love. The world will know that you are my disciples by your love. Yeah. I've talked about this so many times over the past few months that I'm sure most of you know what I'm going to say next, but in case you missed those messages or you were bored out of your mind and fell asleep, I'm going to, I'm going to remind you. Love, the way God defines it, has nothing to do with feelings. Let me say that again. Love, as God defines it, has nothing to do with feelings. Nothing at all. The feelings of love are a byproduct that enhance, sometimes challenge, the relationships that we experience. They're a bonus. They're a plus. They're something that we get as well as. The feelings that we get in love are a byproduct. God describes love like this. Can we read this together? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. <coughs> Love is not a feeling, it's a, it's a choice, it's a decision, it's a life. Something we do, something we experience. Although we get to experience it too, and that's awfully cool. Paul is saying in a way that we should clothe ourselves with this, that we should we can we can put this stuff on, even if we don't feel like this. You don't have to feel like you're in love because it doesn't have anything to do with feelings. It's a decision to do these things. See, I don't have to wake up in the morning feeling patient or feeling kind or feeling envious. I can be patient with you, even when I don't feel patient. I can do that. I can be intentional about that. Trust me, I am not a patient person. <laughs> At all. Ask my wife. No, don't ask my wife. I don't want those stories again now. So, I'm not a patient person, but I have learned how to show patience. Right? I, I, I tend to be kind, so that one's a little bit easier. I, I don't generally envy. I don't try to dishonor people, but I'm just a guy like you, and sometimes I mess that up. I've, I've, I've done that, and, and then had to go and apologize. Always protects, always trusts, always hopes. Man, have I always done those things? I, I don't know. Paul is saying, put them on. He's saying, I get that you may not be feeling those things, but you need to put them on because you're going to face some stuff today. You're going to be confronted by things today. You're going to be exposed to some stuff today. And the enemy, he's out there. It's just like it is with me every time Rachel tries to walk out the door and I have to scream, you know you may not feel like it, but you have to put your coat on. <laughs> Even if we don't feel these things, we can put them on. And we should be grateful about that. You see, when we behave this way, regardless of what we're feeling on the inside, when we behave this way, no matter what's happening, we create an atmosphere of peace. It's amazing what our behavior can do. When we behave this way, we create an atmosphere of peace, and that is something that we are all called to in God. When the activity of faith looks like this, peace is the result. And that is where our oneness comes from. When we do this, love wins. When love wins, it changes us. And the change that happens in us through that makes living the love easier the next time. That's the real circle of life, not to bring the Lion King back up. So, make a choice to, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. Be thankful. Let's keep going. We're almost done. 
There we go. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Okay, so, if we're being real, I could probably preach an entire message just on this last little bit of our passage this morning. In fact, if I really dug deep, I bet you I could preach a, preach a four-part series on these two verses alone, because honestly, there is so much to be said about letting the Word of Christ dwell in us, to live in our hearts, to actually take root and grow within us, to be more than just something we know, but something that we are. Uh, the, 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 the idea of our calling to disciple one another, to raise one another up, to grow together in the faith, to hold each other accountable, and, and not to mention all the stuff we can talk about with regard to our expressions of worship in music. But in the interest of time and of staying on point, I want to focus on this last, this last one, verse 17. I just made it bigger for you. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I, I don't know that we actually do this. I mean, I think we think we do. But I don't know that we always actually do it. And what I mean by that is that before each word we speak, before every action that we take, I, I don't believe that we always have Jesus in mind. I mean, sometimes we do. Definitely sometimes. Sometimes we do. Perhaps even most of the time we do. But I'm challenged by this one because I don't think we always consider Him before we do stuff and say stuff. And I think that's one of the church's big problems, such as this church. Church. Around the globe. I remember listening to a, a message years ago, I think it was Bill Johnson, and he was talking about the day that Jesus was baptized, and uh, he said something that really made me think, and it's something that I'm going to share with you this morning, and it, it comes out of, uh, in, in John chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, there's a, there's a quote from John the Baptist, something that John the Baptist said when he baptized Jesus, he was describing that encounter, and he said this, he said, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, right? I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on Him. I would not have known Him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is He who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down and remained on Jesus. Now, I want you to think about that while we do something a little weird, okay? And for this, I'm going to need a volunteer. Oh, I ain't kidding. I want a volunteer. You're pointing. I see pointing happening, but I don't see hands coming up. Don't be frightened. It will embarrass you. Come on. Anybody? Before I make my wife do it, somebody's going to volunteer. Come on. That's my guy. That's my guy. You can actually stay down there. I don't have a dove. I have a. It's either a duck or a chicken, like a chick. I don't. I don't know. Okay. So I'm going to give you a task. To, it's a duck. He says it's a duck, so it's a duck. It's, we'll call it a ducky because it's a stuffy. It's fuzzy. Okay. It's very soft. You won't get hurt. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to. Get this on your shoulder. No, you can lift your arm a little to balance it, but here's what I want you to do. Oh, no. Come on, ducky. you got to be careful. He's got to stay there. You may not touch the ducky with your hands. Nope. Try not to. What I want you to do, without using your hands, is keep the duck on your shoulder and walk to the other side of the stage. Okay, go ahead. Okay, he's doing it. Look at that. Wow. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to take him. Okay, now you can go back to your seat. Thank you very much. 
much. Do you notice anything different about the way he walked back to his seat as opposed to walking in the first place? Okay, so how did he walk with the bird on his shoulder? Very carefully, yeah. Very carefully. Let me ask you this. How would you walk if you always had a dove, a real dove, perched on your shoulder and you wanted that dove to stay there? I tell you, every single little thing that you did, you would do with that bird in mind, yeah? Yeah. Hmm. Now I wonder what our lives would look like if in whatever we did, in word or in deed, we did it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I'm eating my supper. Or in the name of Jesus, we're talking about family movie now. Or in the name of Jesus, let's have a coffee. And if everything was done in that context, I wonder what my life would look like. I wonder if in every single thing that I did, I had our God at the forefront of all of my actions and all of my words, because I will plainly confess to you, He isn't always the first thing I think of. I react to stuff. I, I have emotions. I go off the map sometimes. That's why I have Tracy. I tell people, if it wasn't for Tracy, I would just float away. She's my tether in life, right? The Lord gave me Tracy. Keep me, keep me here. Otherwise, woo, I disappear. Can you imagine what your life would look like? If that's how we walked in everything that we did, that Jesus was our first and always and only focus. To please Him. To be aware of what He wants for us in every situation, in everything. As believers... Our first work is to discipleship, to spiritual maturity, to growing in the faith, all these other things, the work, the giving, the, 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 the reaching out to people, to even the sharing of the gospel, they all pour out of this. Being like Christ. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. In a moment, we're going to share the Lord's Supper together, and as we prepare for that, I want you to consider all of what we talked about. I know you probably can't read that. It's, it's just the whole scripture in one shot. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if any has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. <clears throat> Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So concerning the Lord's Supper, I'm going to switch mics here. Awkward transition time. Come on. Help. <laughs> Get off. You know, the Paul, uh, Paul warned us not to approach the table of the Lord while we still had animosity for each other, where we were still holding someone in un, a place of unforgiveness. He warned us not to approach the table uh, irreverently. That if we had something going on in our lives, something that was not of the kingdom, that, that we would go, we would make those amends, that we would seek forgiveness or offer forgiveness, that we would go to be right in that relationship. Because that's what it is to be right in this relationship, yes? He wrote this to the Corinthian church. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in your <coughs> And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this 
cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of our Lord. A person ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread or drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself, recognizing the body of the Lord. Of the Lord. This is what we're talking about this morning. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. If there's something that you're dealing with in your heart this morning, I want to invite you to release it. I want to encourage you to let it go. Give it forward to God. Let Him have it. Freedom comes from not holding it anymore, doesn't it? I'm going to invite Leah to come up. We're going to take a few minutes before we enter into the Lord's table. We're going to take a few minutes to apply this stuff that we've talked about today. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on. I know that in the last month alone, I've had more than a dozen conversations about forgiveness and just challenges that people are facing and stuff like that. I know there are some people who struggle with this. And if I could tell you one thing, you need to know you're not alone. It's okay. I've been there many times. We all get there. But I also know that each and every day is an opportunity to set through the door to the new life. Every day is a reset button. Every day in the Lord is a day where we can have breakthrough, where we can have release, where He can take burdens from us and we can walk forward in glory. And today's that day. So we are going to take a few moments and I want to invite you to come forward. <laughs> you don't have to share with me what's going on in your life if, if you want to keep to yourself, that's okay. That's why I took my graph. If somebody wants to tell me, whisper it in my ear, let them know, and I want to pray for you. I'm going to invite Tracy to come up front too. I'm going to invite Tracy to come up too. <laughs> so I can have her with me for this. We're going to take a few moments before we go into communion. I want you to consider what the activity of your faith looks like. Are you in the hustle and bustle to do kingdom things? Or are you generally walking in agreement with the Holy Spirit concerning your own discipleship, maturity, Christ likeness? Now, God can see your heart right where you're sitting. You don't have to come anywhere, you don't have to walk up here, but I do know this that the posture of our bodies often inclines the posture of our hearts. Sometimes what we do physically helps us to get the rest of the way there spiritually or at least in our heart. So as we enter into this time, I want to invite you to come forward and let us pray for you. The rest, stay where you are. Stand your hands out to those that come. Remember, we are not just family, but the church. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us this freedom, Father, that though we're not worthy, though we, maybe even some of us, continue to bumble through this faith life, you are ever forgiven. You are ever merciful. You pour out your grace upon even now in this moment as we come to you Father you are there to forgive you are there to nurture us to help us to grow so Father as we come as we present ourselves to you we pray that you would examine our hearts reveal to us by the power of your spirit Lord show us where we can Struggling with unforgiveness.
forgiveness, Lord. Those of us that have been carrying a, a burden of pain in our heart, Lord, or just a, a friction with, with another person in the body, Father, we just pray that right now 